Well, uh, I hope everyone's doing well in the middle of the pandemic, uh, staying safe. And without further ado, I'll drive in. Uh, I'll dive into the presentation. So I'll start um, giving a brief overview of 2020. So it'll be very focused on the data for performance of crypto and how it's been affected by macroeconomic factors, uh, on-chain uh, trends that we've observed throughout the year, as well as, as in derivatives markets. And finally, we'll have an outlook for 2021 and discussing some topics to keep an eye out for next year. Before getting started, though, uh, as usual, I would like to uh, give a quick, quick update regarding Into the Block, uh, some of our new features and uh, integrations. Um, I'll start with Into the Block resources. So we actually did a, a massive job uh, redesigning all of our resources section so that users can learn how to use and better interpret uh, Into the Block indicators. Feel free to give it a try. Um, on another note, uh, we launched a uh, uh, report on DeFi um, sponsored by Bitstamp. Uh, for those of you who have, have followed Into the Block in 2020, you know that DeFi has been a, a great part of our analytics efforts in this year, as well as in the crypto markets broadly. Um, so I would encourage you to uh, read this report where we um, specify a lot of our research in 2020. I had the pleasure of writing it myself. Um, and lastly, one of our major recent integrations has been the coin market cap Bitcoin 20k page powered by Into the Block. Uh, and it covers a lot of the metrics that I'll be diving in in the presentation. All right, so let's start diving into the data. Um, so as you guys may know, uh, Bitcoin and crypto in general has outperformed um, global markets in 2020. Um, throughout the first half of the year, uh, they were heavily correlated, as you can just see by observing uh, the data in this chart. Um, of course, plummeting during the March crash and what is known as uh, Black Thursday in crypto markets, where Bitcoin crashed over 30% and some other um, alternative currencies crashed by over 50%. Uh, since then though, uh, markets have uh, bounced back and I'll dive into some of the major factors um, along the presentation. Um, so I was, as I was discussing, uh, American indices uh, were highly correlated with Bitcoin and crypto in general. In that period uh, between February and March, uh, reaching as high as 0 0.95 uh, correlation coefficient uh, of course, with one being the highest possible during that March crash. Uh, and the correlation has dropped since, uh, reaching a bottom in November of a, a slightly negative correlation. Uh, and versus Shanghai Composite, interestingly, it, you see almost the inverse pattern, uh, where in February, uh, it reaches a bottom of the lowest correlation, where Shanghai Composite and, of course, China uh, was uh, facing um, the coronavirus pandemic the hardest. And in, in November, you actually see the correlation um, reach its highest point. Um, finally, uh, the rest of global indices um, also see a decreased correlation throughout the year. Uh, for, and only Shanghai Composite, it's, it's grown, it's, been, it's observed a growing pattern throughout 2020. Versus precious metals, uh, we see a similar picture. Um, however, uh, gold, um, even though it started uh, lagging Bitcoin, in February, you see it perform uh, better here. Uh, as, the, of course, the fears of the pandemic and the safe haven uh, starts outperforming, despite crashing afterwards in, in March and sort of staying um, sideways for a while uh, until risk on sentiment recovers uh, back in May and Bitcoin continues uh, outperforming uh, gold and silver also bounces back and at a point even uh, surpasses Bitcoin briefly in terms of performance. Uh, I, worth mentioning, uh, even though these two have moved uh, quite closely in, in the summer, 
uh, we see the correlation between Bitcoin and precious metals uh, drop in October and November as these two, um, as precious metals start retracing and Bitcoin continues to grow um, during the fall. Um, so what are some of the reasons um, for these uh, correlations and, uh, throughout the year? So in August, we see uh, Bitcoin and precious metals hit, hit the highest level in history, actually, uh, versus gold, something like 0 0.97 correlation coefficient. So these, these are the values, by the way, for the most recent. Um, but in, in August, just as the uh, dollar index, well, the US dollar in general, uh, had been crashing, we see a very strong inverse correlation with Bitcoin and the dollar, uh, which of course affected also positively uh, precious metals. So we do see uh, these two uh, growing in August, in the summer. And as I mentioned before, this correlation between the two has slowed down and even turned into an inverse correlation uh, versus Bitcoin as uh, the narrative of uh, Bitcoin as digital gold gains strength and gold and other precious metals retraced. Finally, uh, something that a lot of um, that a lot of people are interested in as um, there has been an increased participation from retail traders in 2020, of course, is the FANG stocks. And we do see um, particularly Amazon and Netflix uh, outperform Bitcoin at the beginning of the, of the year. But of course, uh, with, um, with prices doubling in the fall for Bitcoin, uh, they have left been left uh, behind. And within the crypto space, uh, we do see uh, Bitcoin, of course, having a, a massive 160% return. But it's been um, some other crypto assets have outperformed it even more uh, with remarkable uh, mentions for Chainlink uh, and Ethereum, as well as Ripple uh, with a incredible rally just in the past few weeks. Um, however, these have been more tightly correlated to Bitcoin throughout the year. So notice here that the axis is, uh, it goes from uh, 1.5 to zero. So not just one to negative one, as in the other examples. Uh, this is based on into the block data. And we see that just in, within the 30 months, uh, 30, last 30 days, it's varied between 0 0.94 and 0 0.85 indicating that, of course, uh, this is Ethereum, but it applies for the rest of crypto markets too. Uh, they've moved uh, essentially in tandem uh, throughout most of the year with a few exceptions where it's dropped below 0 0.5. Uh, but in general, we still see that very strong correlation between uh, crypto assets in the space. And uh, so what exactly, I've, I've already rambled enough about how crypto has outperformed uh, macro in 2020, um, but what are the driving forces behind it and what do we expect to continue happening in 2021? <clears throat> so, of course, uh, well, before that, uh, you may not remember some of you, uh, but in the beginning of the year, of course, the tensions with Iran uh, became very, well, uh, tense as uh, the, the, the murder, well, the murder, the assassination of uh, Soleimani uh, from the U.S. military. And at the time, we also saw an increase in Bitcoin and crypto broadly, which increased the safe haven narrative. This is in early January, seems like three years ago. And then, of course, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, took over and markets crashed, uh, shattering the, at least in the short term, the, the appeal of Bitcoin as a safe haven as liquidity dried up in all markets and the world entered a global recession. And then of course, uh, we do see a massive, um, unprecedented amount of, uh, of stimulus uh, provided by the Federal Reserve and other central banks uh, around the world. In the case of the United States, of course, uh, which has the, um, the global reserve currency, uh, the Fed emitted a 2.3 trillion uh, relief package uh, something unheard of compared to the already unprecedented uh, QE seen in the global financial crisis of 2009. 
Um, and as well, uh, for the first time, they provided US citizens uh, $1,200 stimulus, which coincidentally aligned with an increase of uh, 4x in the amount of deposits of 1,200 in Coinbase. Uh, and it, it's, it, in general, it provided essentially support for assets, especially for corporate debt, even buying uh, junk bonds in some cases. And it provided the liquidity for the market to continue growing to new highs and uh, gave back the risk on sentiment um, as markets overall. So some of the highest returns in the decade, in the last decades or so. Um, so uh, all silliness aside, uh, the macro perspective, we saw uh, US dollar uh, supply reach all time highs. And along with it, uh, the debt and the increase in supply has led to inflation fears, which have sort of um, uh, ignited the appeal, the demand for investors to invest in, in sovereign and non uh, correlated assets and um, of course with Bitcoin uh, filling that gap that void for investors <clears throat> so at the moment uh, global debt in most developed countries is at the highest since World War II I believe this graphic is from uh, the summer and it has since surpassed uh, World War II levels um, USD dollar um, DXY index has dropped as well to highest to lowest level, sorry, in over four years, uh, which has seen an increase in in the store of value assets such as precious metals and uh, Bitcoin. And uh, overall, we're seeing this pattern of investors, especially institutional ones, uh, looking to hedge <clears throat> their positions in a market where uh, traditional indices are, are at all time highs. And uh, we see other assets such as uh, gold and Bitcoin uh, being gaining strength, strength as a store of value thesis. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so another uh, big catalyst that came from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is uh, digitalization. So as you can see here, some of you might have seen this graphic, uh, we see this pattern of um, e-commerce growing uh, constantly throughout the decade and then uh, suddenly spiking um, in 2020, as of course people were forced to be in quarantine, uh, growing the demand for digital goods in general. And you may be wondering what, has, what this has to do with Bitcoin. And the reality is that we see something similar with uh, institutional adoption. Uh, so, of course, Bitcoin being a digital asset, uh, it's sort of filled that narrative of that for the 21st century, we have a digital, digitally native store of value asset, while gold is the analog um, asset that has served in the past this, this role of being a store of value, not being able to be controlled by a particular government or entity. So this has strengthened uh, Bitcoin's uh, narrative as digital gold, and it also poses <clears throat> asymmetric upside, given that it's a much smaller market cap uh, of around 350 billion for Bitcoin, while gold has already stab established itself for centuries uh, at around 9 trillion market cap at the moment. Um, along with this, it spiked interest from uh, major institutions, of course, uh, from the likes of Fidelity, BlackRock, uh, Square, uh, PayPal, and MicroStrategy, and renowned figures within uh, Wall Street, such as Paul Tudor Jones and Stanley Druckenmiller. Uh, one of the main benefactors of this trend has been uh, Grayscale, with its GBTC fund, which of course is one of the most popular um, in vehicle for investments for Bitcoin in the traditional markets, has seen its uh, assets under management more than quadruple in 2020, uh, as, as you can see, uh, spiking <clears throat> significantly uh, in, in the summer and fall, along with prices, of course, but uh, the amount of Bitcoin itself has grown to over 500,000, I believe from uh, around 200,000 at the beginning of the year. 
Um, and on-chain, so uh, we're done with the macro part and diving into the on-chain aspect, we see an intercorrelation between these factors, of course. So one uh, indicator at Interblock that we like to monitor is large transactions, which we define as transactions with over $100,000 uh, transacted in them. And for Bitcoin, in this case, as shown below, uh, it's more than quadrupled uh, the, the total volume in aggregate transactions of over 100,000 from around 7 billion to around 30 billion. Um, and you can see, of course, that the trend accelerates first in the summer <clears throat> and even more in the fall as we see a wave of institutions. For instance, this is when uh, the, one of the highest points was when PayPal announced that it will be releasing uh, the option for, for its users to buy and a wave of more uh, established institutions uh, buying and supporting uh, cryptocurrency in general. Um, for, from another on-chain uh, indicator that we'd like to review at Into the Block, uh, this is the uns unspent transactions output age. And essentially what this tells us, <clears throat> using the UTXO accounting mechanism from proof-of-work blockchains, uh, we can derive uh, the length that these uh, coins, Bitcoin in, in the case, has been held, have been held for. And we plot this as the percentage of uh, tokens that haven't moved in a particular time range. And we can see here, for instance, that the, <clears throat> the amount of Bitcoin held in addresses from 12 months to over five years reached a new all-time high, uh, the percentage of those uh, in, in the summer, late summer, <clears throat> uh, reaching a new high which essentially strengthens its proposition as a store of value, given that this long-term investment horizon uh, aligns with in investors essentially expecting long-term gains rather than just short-term speculation uh, from the tra active traders. And what we've seen before is this type of cycle occur um, most clearly in, in the last one, uh, where we see long-term uh, holders peak and then we see a, a wave of uh, new interest, new money coming in. <clears throat> uh, like we saw here with uh, addresses that have been holding for one to three months or less uh, growing. So those are the orange and red colors. Uh, and we see the same pattern emerging here in the late fall. Uh, finally, in terms of uh, net network activity, uh, daily active addresses is a proxy we like to use for um, the number of users uh, actively using Bitcoin. So, of course, one address isn't exactly equal to one user. One address, one user can have more than one address. And at the same time, one entity can manage more than one user's uh, money. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, we assume that that ratio has been relatively stable throughout time. And we can see that it's grown and surpassed 1 million for the same for the first time since January of the 2018. Uh, and we see an increased activity here in the summer, uh, right before um, prices start breaking out, which of course uh, we've pointed out in several articles as being a bullish uh, signal as interest and activity on chain has grown uh, at around the same par uh, pace as price. <clears throat> uh, finally, from a derivatives point of view, uh, we do see um, especially options um, really, really grow incredibly uh, in 2020, uh, 10xing, uh, that's a word, in 2020. And for petrol swaps, which had already been relatively more established last year, uh, they still managed to 3x in terms of open interest, uh, which in case you are not too familiar with um, derivatives terminology, uh, open interest tracks the total amount of, of dollar amount of positions being open at a particular point in time. And we're currently in all time highs, both for options and perpetual swaps. <clears throat> um, finally, um, I wanted to dive into uh, some of the patterns that we see 
So of course I've uh, rambled about the macroeconomic involvement of these in crypto and how these are expected to affect uh, crypto assets in 2021 and beyond. So what we're seeing right now is institutional players already seeking uh, incredible amounts of exposure to Bitcoin. But um, something a lot of people have pointed out is that retail, at least the average retail uh, users, not those particularly involved within crypto, <clears throat> are still sort of in disbelief. And anecdotally, uh, I've discussed with many friends, of course, that now that Bitcoin has increased uh, back to 20K, we do see interest spiking in Google searches, but we do see, still see many that are fearful uh, given that last time Bitcoin was at 20K and we traced all the way back to 3K. So I would argue that many retail traders are still in disbelief and uh, they may, they are probably not expecting another bubble cycle. Um, but as I covered earlier um, with the UTXO chart, uh, we do that increase in short term activity is usually uh, essentially a, a turning point um, where we are expected to to see a, an, a, the beginning of a bubble phase similar to what where we were in December 2016, four years ago or so. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and essentially another um, factor that I've been looking at in 2020, and I, I believe is likely to continue, is the development of sectors within crypto. So of course, in 2020, uh, the largest, at least in terms of growth to develop, has been DeFi. And uh, we see uh, DeFi has, in, in a way, uh, uncorrelated at times versus the broader market, even uh, so, for instance, in the early summer, outpacing the rest of the market and in early fall, falling while crypto and Bitcoin specifically were still continuing to rise. And I expect um, over time, so it might not be this is more longer term outlook, over time, uh, these two uncorrelate uh, the sectors and even the, the, the protocols within them versus broader crypto, uh, of course. Um, as long as there's no liquidity shocks and no and not another pandemic in 2021. Um, in regards to macro factors, um, we do see global debt, as I mentioned, being an, at new highs. And this, this of course, has been uh, propelling markets upwards in 2020. And it may very well continue to be the same as uh, interest rates are uh, at zero or below zero in, in real uh, terms in, in many parts across the world. So this encourages people to, of course, take out more debt and more leverage, uh, which in turn may continue to propel markets. Um, but of course, as the increases risks, um, I don't know if it will be in 2021, um, but down the road, eventually, of course, if we continue seeing this growth, particularly in traditional markets, <clears throat> of a potential correction. Uh, and as we've seen with crypto, there's uh, in moments of high volatility, they've also affected uh, crypto in general. So it is likely if we do see a major correction that, that those correlations um, get tied back again, converge. Um, but overall, if, if, if the, the growth ends up being more moderate, as we've seen at, at the moment with some hopes for the COVID vaccine. Uh, I do expect them to be relatively uncorrelated as it has been uh, throughout the fall. Um, as well, though, uh, some of the downsides from, from, these, um, from the COVID response, such as inflation and rising inequality, can also be a, an opportunity in a way for uh, Bitcoin. Uh, as um, inflation fears, of course, increases the demand for a global sovereign uh, hedge, non-sovereign hedge, uh, such as the one Bitcoin can act as uh, in the case of being a digital gold. Uh, and as well, this is also an opportunity for the protocols being built uh, than smart uh, contract applications, <clears throat> which can enable 
um, higher yields, of course, in a market where there is, uh, in traditional markets, when their yields are near all-time lows as well, uh, as well as demand for a universal access of um, financial services for those that are unfortunately being hurt the most for, uh, from the COVID-19 crisis. So we, we do expect um, this to eventually drive more demand for, for decentralized protocols, but it may be something that of course takes longer than just one year. Um, and some of other things that I wanted to point out that may be um, essentially turning points for crypto in general in 2021 and beyond is uh, S&P uh, and Dow Jones just announced that they'll be supporting crypto indices in 2021. These, of course, can act as a major stamp of approval from a uh, legitimate traditional market entity, which can, of course, be a major force for both institutional and retail adoption in 2020, 2021. Um, along with that, though, there's an increasing amount of regulation in the crypto space. So uh, the most recent that we've seen is the Stable Act, which um, in which they, they require, well, they propose to require all stable coins to have a bank charter, which of course uh, none of them do at the moment. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Kraken's the only exchange with a bank charter at the moment. Uh, so that would uh, really be a downside for adoption, uh, given that stable coins are the most transacted crypto assets at the moment with over, um, I believe it was, 300 billion in 2020. Uh, I forgot the numbers, the precise number at the moment. Um, and so regulation is likely to play an increasing role in 2021. And as the, the sector essentially gets more uh, legitimate uh, and in the eyes of regulatory forces. And finally, the downside to increasing demand and activity is that there is expected to be more crypto scams, unfortunately, in 2021 as more retail uh, people turn their eyes into crypto. Uh, I only have one minute left, but we wanted to announce that we're launch launching Macro Insights. Uh, so it's a similar approach to DeFi Insights within uh, or into the blog page. And it, it will cover a lot of the, the incredible insights that I've been covering uh, within this presentation and as well as in the uh, Coin market cap Bitcoin 20k page. Uh, some of the potential indicators include performance versus stocks, commodities, indices, and even ETFs and particular uh, companies. So many of the charts that I've been showing, um, similar correlations and volatility comparisons uh, will support the sharp ratio and Certino, uh, crypto in context of traditional sectors. So for instance, uh, we saw that crypto markets have already surpassed the tobacco industry. And it's interesting to see how they rank uh, in a way in terms of market cap. And finally, uh, we, we really value everyone's feedback here. Uh, so if you do have any recommendations for us to add, we will be glad to evaluate and add them. Uh, we, our intention is to launch this uh, or by early next year, uh, maybe even before the end of the year. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, our next webinar uh, will be on the, our predictions models. Uh, it's been a while since we've done one of these and our data analytics team has done remarkable progress. So our CEO, Jesus Rodriguez, will be uh, showing some of the progress that we've done <clears throat> uh, so that you can also uh, examine predictive models if you're interested into machine learning for crypto. Our team will supply, will provide that on the chat right now. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, thank you very much everyone for tuning in. Uh, I'll be glad to answer some questions via the chat right now. Okay, I'll give a few minutes for, for the questions.
All right. Well, um, I guess that'll be it then. Uh, thank you everyone for, for tuning in. Hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. Oh, we do have a question now. Uh, for some reason, I can't see the Q&A. Uh, oh, okay. So we did have some questions. Apologies. Uh, I assume was having some technical problems. So Tessa is asking if, if the PowerPoint is available online. Um, yes, uh, it'll be available uh, through SlideShare or a website like that, uh, as well as a recording of the presentation uh, tomorrow or the day after that. Um, someone, uh, Darius is asking if we're planning on implementing uh, some charts. So the M NUPL, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, the MVRV, uh, Z-score, LTH, MVRV, and reserve risk. Uh, Darius, if I'm, I'm being honest, I'll have to do some research into those, but I've, I'm copying and pasting those into my own notes. So I'll, I'll look into those um, and potentially uh, explore adding them into our macro section. Um, the webinar, yes, uh, Marcel, the webinar will be available for the first part. You can see everything online on our YouTube page tomorrow. Um, so yeah, Ruben, we're planning, uh, he's asking if, if we're planning to integrate, uh, oh, he's, he's asking if we were planning to integrate news in this macro view of the markets. That's a good question, actually. Uh, at the moment, given that we're more of a data centric company, uh, we're looking at providing the data, but it may be worth exploring adding uh, news to this part, given that, that of course, it, it's um, a major factor in, in the macro sense. Uh, so not at the moment, but we, we will look into that. Um, Stefan says, thank you. Very nice presentation. I'll be back next time. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Glad you enjoyed it. Uh, another Stefan uh, asks, how big of a chance do you see in BTC becoming a, a government accepted asset like gold with some regulation and no cold, like no cold wallets? This is a very interesting question. And of course, something that many in the industry have kept an eye on. Um, in, so in the imminent future, um, I do not see it short term as in 2021 for any developed country uh, doing so. Um, I, 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 for in the developing countries and in this Venezuela already mines Bitcoin, uh, where I'm from, the military. And Iran has also, uh, I believe, done similar measures accepting it. Uh, but I, this also trumps the risk of developed countries adopting it. So I, I think it's still too early uh, in the macro point of view. 12 years for an asset is nothing compared to something like gold, which of course has centuries. Um, so I think we're still at the institutional uh, part of things for, for this upcoming cycle. Maybe towards the end, we'll see larger countries um, spe essentially buying some Bitcoin. But I do not see it, if I'm being honest, uh, just my level-headed approach within the next two or three years. But it do what we do see, though, is the development of CBDCs, of course, central bank uh, digital currencies that may lead to greater adoption in decentralized crypto assets, given that the similar uh, adoption mechanisms. But um, we were already seeing a lot of uh, efforts being accelerated due to the digitalization uh, catalyst that the, that the pandemic acted as. Uh, Darius asks, what's the biggest threat to Bitcoin? Um, there is such a good question and a lot of people would pose that uh, the risk of a government banning Bitcoin would be that. I, I disagree actually. Um, I don't think any developed country, uh, like even if they really tried banning it, um, they, it would be a very, um, very disruptive attempt and I don't think they would be completely successful at doing that. So I don't think that's the risk. Uh, I think still we rely a lot on centralized entities such as exchanges and miners. 
So uh, it's not a massive risk, but there is there is certain level of risk of uh, relying, of course, in um, central points of failure, uh, such as exchanges being hacked uh, and miners colluding. But I wouldn't say it's a uh, a risk I anticipate of anything, any downsides occurring in the near future. Um, thanks again, Stefan, for your nice comments. Um, Darius is asking, what would happen to BTC price if Tether is banned? Yeah, so I sort of hinted at this uh, with uh, when I discussed the stable act. Um, I think it would be very negative. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I think stable coins in general, not just Tether, uh, have been a major point of entry for crypto, uh, as well as, a, of course, medium of exchange um, within this space. Uh, so they've s surpassed Bitcoin in terms of volume. And I think if you, we do see that liquidity dry up, at least in the short term, I expect uh, some type of crash. But in the longer term, uh, if there are more legitimate um, or at least I think they'll probably find really a, a midpoint. I don't think they'll ask for bank charters for stable coins, um, but it will drive it, this regulation in theory should uh, legitimize crypto in general um, and see it uh, and ease the, the risks and anxiety of institutional, more conservative investors. So in, in general, the regulation in the long term should benefit crypto, but I'm, I'm not personally in favor of very strict um, regulations like the ones proposed in the Stable Act. Um, yeah, uh, Ruben, what do you, he asks, what do you think about stock to flow indicator on BTC? And uh, I would say it, it was omitted on my presentation on purpose. Uh, frankly, uh, us, many of us at Into the Block, including myself, do not think that the 800 million or so uh, dollars in Bitcoin mined per day uh, is enough to have a price impact in, in Bitcoin. Uh, I do not think and uh, data proves that miners are not the biggest selling force in crypto anymore. They haven't been for the last five years, maybe uh, since it's grown so much. Um, I think it's very, even Vitalik has discussed it. It's unfalsifiable in a way because people say if, if the price of Bitcoin rises, Oh, it's because of anticipation of the having. If it rises after, it's oh, it's because of the having. So there's no no really way, easy way to um, falsify um, the stock to flow model, as long as Bitcoin continues to rise. And in the long term, which is like where it definitely uh, has a major issue, is once the the flow or the the um, circulating supply of Bitcoin approaches 21 million and the supply is so small, uh, the supply increase is so small that that would essentially imply a, a valuation of tens of trillions for Bitcoin surpassing the global economy eventually. So that doesn't make sense and it's a massive flaw of that model. Um, and there's been also smaller crypto assets such as Zcash and Litecoin have their own halvings and decreased supply and have very little impact on price. So well, it's yet to be seen. I'm more inclined on it uh, not uh, playing off as the catalyst um, rather than more just organic and institutional adoption uh, leading this rally forward. Um, all right, I think uh, that's it for the questions. Um, thank you guys very much. You asked good questions. Uh, thank you for your time. Hope you guys all have a great, uh, end of the year and happy holidays. Uh, bye now.